Next, we, from Oakland, California, we have Entropic Materials. Presenting for Entropic Materials is Aaron Hall, founder and CEO. Welcome him to the stage. Seven point three billion tons of plastic have been produced since the 1950s, and 86 percent of that has become waste. Six point three billion tons of plastic polluting our land, oceans, air. We're even seeing microplastics in babies in the womb. This is insanity. And why are we making so much of this stuff? Because the properties of plastics are absolutely incredible, and they are now a central part of our modern world. They're an enabling technology for just about every product category that every one of us cares about. And it's a $600 billion industry. Plastics are not going away anytime soon, unless we have something to do with it. At Entropic Materials, we're commercializing a breakthrough enzyme stabilization technology that lets us embed the tools necessary to break down plastics directly inside of them. Plastics are made of polymers, and polymers are found all over nature, whether it be cellulose in vegetables, chitin in crab shells, or gluten in mac and cheese. I used to be a chef, so I think in food analogies. And we don't worry about these polymers polluting our planet and causing problems. Why? Because nature has evolved another class of polymers called enzymes that can break down polymers. They act like scissors, cutting up the individual chains so that the small molecules that are left behind can be readily broken down in the soil by microbes and returned back to the planet. And there are enzymes that can break down plastics. So great, let's just use them, right? Well, unfortunately, no, because we haven't built our system for that. We've been focused on recycling. And while recycling is great when it works, the reality is that infrastructure is incredibly fragmented, even where it does exist. There's a lot of steps required, it's laborious, and the margins are not that attractive, which severely limits the adoption. So we started looking at compostable plastics, which are great, but again, that infrastructure isn't all that available, and even when the materials get in there, they're slow to break down. And using enzymes directly has not been available because although they're incredible at doing their work, they're fragile once you take them out of cells. And so they tend to fall apart. But we have a solution for that. At Entropic Materials, our enzyme stabilization technology lets us embed the enzymes directly within the plastic, protecting them from the processing environment so we can turn them on at the end of life and degrade the materials from the inside out. This accelerates the degradation rate from months to years down to days or weeks. Now, I couldn't bring a whole manufacturing and composting infrastructure up here on the stage, and the plastics are not going to break down in six minutes, which is actually probably a good thing. So you'll have to trust me that plastics like these, with our technology inside, break down rapidly and completely at the end of life. I'm going to show you some pictures from some of our peer-reviewed publications in journals like Science and Nature, where we showed this technology. Here I'm showing a film just like the one I showed you. In just a few days in compost, you see a dramatic difference. It goes from clear to white, and those little white flakes are so brittle, you can pick them up and they just turn to powder. These materials break down in the soil just like natural polymers, leaving nothing behind. And we can get degradation in warm water baths. And this is really important, because this is very simple infrastructure that's easy to scale, enabling us to think about decentralizing the waste stream. And if we did this in an industrial context, we could actually recapture the degraded monomers and repolymerize them for a circular economy approach. And through some clever engineering that we've been able to do, we actually get degradation from one end of the polymer chain to the other which eliminates the microplastics at the source, which is really important and a very unique piece of our system. We're formulating as a drop-in additive. It's readily scalable. Enzymes are efficient, so there's a low usage level, and the degradation is on demand. 
We're targeting PLA as our first market. This is the most common compostable plastic and one of the fastest growing segments within the industry. And we've chosen this because we have a few unique value propositions that we bring. We get to expand the design space for these plastics to include a wider variety of products. We help get past some of the regulatory hurdles and we open up more favorable conditions at the end of life. And we're an awesome team to do this. I'm commercializing this work out of my PhD at UC Berkeley, where I spent five years developing this core technology. And I've brought on Jolene Matson, who led Ripple's first scale up to support us in scaling up these materials. I've also been able to attract support from the Department of Energy, activate one of the best accelerators in the country for deep tech, as well as fantastic advisors and uh, investors in our seed round earlier this year. So connect with us. We're going to be launching our first pilots next year as we scale up to the kilogram scale, and we'd love to collaborate with brands and partners that are looking to implement more sustainable options. And we're growing our team. At Entropic Materials, we're using enzymes to change the way that we make and break down materials. Join the movement. Thank you. Aileen, can we start with you? Sure. Uh, well done. The storytelling was really great. Well Thank done. You. Can you talk a little bit about the scale? You said scaling to kilogram scale. So what has to happen? Like, what does the plant look like? What does it entail? Do you do? And you said you insert into existing plastics. So do you have to build it like where people are making plastic bottles right now? Talk yeah. a little bit about the Absolutely. process. Yeah, happy to do that. Um, so you can really think about each plastic that we break down as like a three-part uh, system. So there's the plastic itself, which is a bulk material, that's going to be 99 plus percent of what it actually is. Then there's our stabilizers and the enzyme. Those two come together as an additive that will get added in at the very beginning of the manufacturing process. So they'll take plastic pellets, we'll add in a little bit of powder, this is called a master batch in the industry, and then that will get converted into a bag, a cup, a cell phone case, whatever product of interest there. Uh, in terms of the scale up, we're scaling up our proprietary stabilization technology. Uh, that's through a chemical synthesis approach. Uh, and so what's really nice about it is I've been able to actually attract and gather a couple of great industry veterans who've been at some of the big chemical companies in polymers who are providing some insight and guidance on what we exactly need to hit in order to be compatible with the existing manufacturing streams. So do we know what the process is going to be or like have we made the enzyme? Like where, where is it in terms of the manufacturing process already? Uh, yeah, so we've worked with commercially available enzymes, which is great because that brings the cost down dramatically. Um, we, over time, can look at custom enzymes as well and do enzyme engineering for specific use cases, but obviously off the shelf is going to be cheaper. Um, our materials are proprietary, and then the, the polymers themselves are made at commodity scales. So we have a process, and we publish this in Nature, um, you know, a preliminary process, and we've refined that over time uh, in order to streamline it so we can easily integrate in. Okay. You can go with David and then Mark. Can you talk about the company? Uh, first off, like amazing vision. Uh, hope it works at scale and Thank saves you. the world. So that's awesome. <laughs> um, it's true. Who doesn't? Yeah. Um, but we talk about company vision. B2B ingredient company. Is that what you are? Do you want to be full stack in some sense? As you think about who do you sell to? Is it the sort of visible consumer product companies? You mentioned Coke. Yep. Uh, last time on stage, or is it the industrial world that actually can make a bigger impact? Just sort of play this out. Yep. What do you want to build? Yeah, absolutely happy to talk about that. So um, we're an enzyme stabilization company at our core, and enzymes do an incredible diversity of chemistry, not just degrading plastics. They can make pharmaceuticals. They can make you know, specialty molecules. They're the workhorses of biology. Like when we eat all those foods I was showing, we got enzymes breaking all that stuff down, and enzymes were making it in the first place. So uh, there's a lot of opportunity space for us to think about from the platform level. In terms of the plastics where we're first targeting, um, we've done a lot of customer discovery work at the front end, really mapping out the ecosystem. Um, so despite having a PhD in polymer science, they don't teach you how the industry works. So I had to get out of the lab and actually go talk to people. Um, and so I talked to people kind of all across the chain. And I have a, really, a much better understanding of how that structure works. Uh, and so I'm going to give you kind of a couple of options that we're exploring. We haven't nailed down into one specific, uh, but we have conversations going in each segment. So we can actually work with the front end resin manufacturers, um, which is great because that's a push into the system. Um, for them, that's cost increase. 
So of course, they're only going to want to adopt when they have to, which there's other angles we can play on that. But we open up, so it, with PLA at least, we actually open up the design space. So we give PLA plastics more opportunities to make compostable products because we speed up the degradation. And everyone needs to label that it's compostable if they're going to adopt. No one's going to make the change if they can't get the brand value and the communication, right? Um, so we're going to open up that and really open up the design space for wider product. We can also go directly downstream, right, to the brands, which is the consumer-facing site. They're the ones making the public commitments. And we've had some great conversations in that space with both some tech companies as well as, uh, you know, for products, right, packaging and things like that, as well as from the food side uh, where just a lot of the material is being made. Um, and then we have some ideas about how we go further from there. And then this final option that I share, which we're not committed on this yet, but it's something that's always fun as someone that was creative, is that the center of that manufacturing chain is a lot of contract manufacturing. And so we could just bring a product through them to the market, direct to the consumers, right? And really build up brand. And that's and a full stack vision, right? Exactly. And I think for me, um, something that's going to be important with the company is actually building the brand and the brand recognition. So it's really nice to be up here um, because we want to be like a Gore-Tex for degradation, right? Or an Intel inside, right? We want to be able to capture some of that um, and offer that to companies. You know, a lot of big companies struggle with consumers trusting them. There's a lot of skepticism. So, Thank you. Yeah. Aaron, I have a question about the technology. Yes. What triggers the enzyme? Mm -hmm. I think you mentioned water, but you know, yep. if it's triggered by water or heat, mm -hmm. yep. do you use it for food? And yeah. if not, what type of plastic products you use it? Totally. Yeah. So it's water and heat together. Okay. It's not one or the other. So it's, not coffee. What, and so it's not also <laughs> not humidity, right? Uh, it's not, not just humidity. You really need either submersion into water or a compost, like a wet compost type environment to get degradation. We can also do engineering to put other triggers into the system if need be. Um, but we're trying to move quickly on what is the first uh, validated okay. you know, performance from there. Um, and then there's some tuning in terms of the temperature that we can do. So we're looking at typically like 40 to 60 Celsius, uh, but we can do some tuning and tailoring on that as well. Okay, got it. Yeah, and then in terms of products we didn't, we wouldn't do like we're not looking at water bottles for instance yeah but also water bottles are one of the few successes in recycling so i think it'd be kind of so kind of my follow-up question is what sort of products are you guys looking at do you go first to the brands and retailers and if so who, who or do you go to the plastic manufacturers like yeah know? yeah so in a lot of these conversations we've had um people want prototypes in their hands right that's really like what yeah both of the brand side as well as the resin side or you know that direction right um they both want that. And so that's why we're scaling up to the kilo scale first. Uh, as an additive, that's going to lead to 100 kilos. And we bought some injection molding equipment, and we've made some films. And so we'll be able to actually start making you know, wrap and, and products and actually putting them in hands. And we're going to be really driven by customer engagement okay. um, because we're building products, right? Well, that there's answer? one quick question. I mean, this is maybe, I know, I know you're injecting the enzymes and building the, pla you know, manufacturing the plastic that way. Could yeah. you? Kind of spray the plastic in the recycling center afterwards, and I don't know, then you don't care about heat and what? And yeah, yeah, that's a great question. So there are approaches, and people okay. are looking at doing enzymes in, like, say, a big tank and, yeah. and put plastic in there. Uh, I think the hard part is that enzymes tend to be fragile. So putting them in this environment that, you know, post-consumer plastics, it's like a whole mixed bag. It's waste. You got oil stuff in there. You got... Okay, I, we can talk off stage. <laughs> yeah, happy to share more. Yes, in theory, but there's a lot to it. To, to that question, and we're an investor in a different company taking a similar approach to what you alluded to, but oh. is this a race in terms of cost? And you, you said it before, right? You have to be cheap enough that the sort of company goes for it because they're going to make that sort of brand calculation. Yes. Uh, and if it's yeah. not government mandated that plastic manufacturers are thinking about mm -hmm. um, the world differently, they're going to go for the lowest cost option. Can so, I build on that too? It's like, what is the moat? Like there's a lot of people who will be yes. going after this. Like what is the differentiation yep. for you versus other people who are going to try the same thing? Yeah, definitely. So a lot of the other players I see in the space are really enzyme engineering <clears throat> platforms. Uh, they're looking at trying to use AI to basically design enzymes to do things, right? Mm. And they're going to be limited in a lot of ways to the environments that enzymes are just inherently stable within. Um, and those are mostly downstream plays meaning they're going to have to still face the same challenges that the current recycling stream faces, which is going to collect, sort, clean, and then process into the package. Uh, where we can really differentiate is that we can actually go in at the beginning. We can think about going in at the end as well. That's not off the table. But by being able to go in at the beginning, it includes the tools at the, right at the start. 
right? So it's like IKEA, you get your furniture, it comes with the tool to build it. You don't have to go find one after you get it home, and that is part of it. And then in terms of moats, uh, so there's some IP that we have around this. We're also building out further IP uh, catalog, and then just from my time in my PhD, developed a lot of internal understanding and knowledge about how these systems behave, and really bringing the, the energy landscape kind of in alignment uh, to be able to engineer toward these things. So we're moving, trying to move fast. We're also working on IP, and then there's some trade secret stuff. I think most of it was covered. Uh, what, what differentiates you from any other encapsulation company specifically? Because mm -hmm. uh, there are a lot of enzyme engineering companies, as you mentioned. Well, not a lot, but there are a sure. few. Yep. Um, what about other encapsulation companies? What's your moat specifically? Mm -hmm. The, the other en short. enzyme luggage people. Yeah. Um, oh, are we? No, it's fine. Yeah. Great. Okay. Just keep it short. Absolutely. Yeah, so there's a lot of enzyme immobilization. This is not the first time anyone's tried some of this, this work. Uh, what we've shown in our previous publications is that we have some best-in-class performance, uh, and it's a platform across a wide variety. Uh, so I like to use a kind of clothing analogy. It's small to extra large, and that covers a large swath of the enzyme space uh, that we can do without actually tailoring each individual uh, design. And we can tailor if need be, right? Because sometimes it needs to be perfect. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Give them a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.